from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. All right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with you. I'm so glad that you were all able to make it. Um, I have with me two wonderful composers and people, Oliver Nussen and Mark Nykrug. I'm the people. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, so I, th I thought we could just take this opportunity to talk about uh, Oliver Nussen's uh, residency at the library and also some of the works that are on tonight's program and the experiences that you've had since you've been here. And maybe one place to, to narrow that down a bit at first is I understand that you were able to go take a look at some manuscripts just this afternoon. Um, I'm wondering how, what was that experience like? Well, the reason that this event, not this particular, well, this is part of this well, the reason that this event, this whole week, is happening is because I actually went to look at some manuscripts around maybe four years ago um, and I was uh, given an introduction to Kate Rivers at the library by Fred Sherry my old friend the cellist and uh, I said if, asked if I could come down and look at some some things that are kept across the road which some of us in you know Find it's quite thrilling that to actually get their mitts on the um, the manuscript of Wozzeck. And uh, what else did I see that day? The Berg Violin Concerto, The Fairy's Kiss by Stravinsky, which I had recorded, which Kate did not know, which was an unbelievable coincidence, and so forth and so forth. And so therefore, when I came back to Washington two years later, I asked to do the same thing and this time brought a friend with me, I mean, I'm sure this, and saw some other things. Again, just, um, I remember that time we looked in particular, I looked at the Schoenberg Serenade, some Schoenberg stuff, and my young uh, conductor colleague friend looked at uh, um, Jonathan Berman, he looked at Piero Lunaire, and the Schumann Spring Symphony, and I mean, it, I mean it's like being, for people like us, it's like going to the world's greatest toy shop, except they ain't toys. <laughs> and um, at some point on that day, Kate said um, they had a new scheme starting because of this Dina Coston um, fund. And would I be interested in coming and being in residence for a week? Well, it's like saying, could you, you know, could you, for, to a kid, would you like to live in Macy's for a week <laughs> in the old days? So. Um, I said, well, what would I need to do? And she said, um, um, preferably try and construct the programs around manuscripts that are held here, pieces of which the manuscripts are held here, which that is actually no problem. <laughs> and um, apart from a couple of minor, um, you know, practical hurdles to, to get through, for example, the Schoenberg Serenade which we played on Tuesday, is a piece that is not much played and not much loved, unfortunately, and happens to be something that I've done with the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group before. And my Ophelia dance is um, uh, also, um, which lives here, and I, I quake in my boots to say, <laughs> Um, it's, a, it's a very old piece and a very short one um, is also a piece that the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group have played many times um, one of the pieces that I have one of the composers, American composers which has, who has fascinated me the most um, over the years is Ruth Crawford Seeger because I just don't understand how somebody could suddenly become a great composer for about five years and then start collecting folk songs and just you know, just like the, the, just the, but the pieces that she wrote between what the late 1927, 1927, let's say, and about 1933, 
are almost without exception masterpieces. And it's like somebody going for something completely unknown and getting it right first time in every case. It's really one of the most extraordinary and under, um, excuse my th voice by the way, what I managed to happen after the concert on Tuesday is I contracted a revolting bug, which you don't need to know about, but that's why I'm croaking. Um, so I'd recorded a lot of Ruth Crawford Seeger and actually had, with the Birmingham group, about a year ago, two years ago, done these three songs, which are one of the most extraordinary of all the pieces. So it made sense to bring the Birmingham group to play these pieces. And um, it made sense in the context of that concert to play my other Ophelia piece, which is, was a, a way of... <laughs> So to be quite blunt, a way of war warming up leftovers from the first one, but it came out okay. And um, and then I thought to start with the Stravinsky Septet, which is not here at all, but it was written for um, for the Dumbarton Oaks, which is a Washington thing. So I was, if you take that as being the first program, I don't think I've left it. Oh, the Castiglione piece that was in there which I think it was mentioned to me back then that it would be nice to do something by Castiglione, who is a composer I, lo I love very much and, and doesn't get played. Anyway, um, if you take then, let's say, tomorrow's concert, that also begins with a piece by Stravinsky, but a, 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 the, the symphonies of wind instruments and ends with a, another great serenade. This is, by the way, the president's own uh, uh, marine band. Yeah. That will be tomorrow. Yeah. And uh, it, just, it was a <coughs> practical consideration that I was trying to come up with something that, w that would work. Um, um, and we decided to use, I, I said, aren't there some really great wind bands in this town? And which I, I knew nothing about, but I'd heard a sort of rumor and they, they are amazing. So um, did a few of my favorite pieces with them. And this concert in the middle, um, well, it started from the premise that um, there was to be an, a new work commissioned, and I knew that my friend Mark Nykrug, this is another topic that might, we might discuss later, is a composer with a great deal of experience. This was not that long ago, this discussion. Was uh, uh, is a composer with a great deal of experience writing chamber music, whereas I am not. And it, therefore, it's very difficult to program a festival of chamber music which, which contains more than a couple of my pieces because they just ain't there. Mm. And um, I've written a lot of uh, ensemble pieces involving voice and all that. But the main thing was that I wanted to play, also to have played in this, one of the big chamber pieces by Frank Bridge, um, who is a composer less underrated in England now than he was when I was a kid, when the only person who ever played any of his pieces was Benjamin Britten, about every two or three years. Now you can buy recordings of everything, but it's been one of the great discoveries. And a great deal of the manuscripts um, of Frank Bridge, our house right here, because he was one of Mrs. Coolidge's protégés. And she actually supported him financially. She paid, you know, she he accepted a, a sort of living wage of her for several years, which enabled him to give up orchestral playing and to compose. So I thought that with a, a new piece, and, uh, and then of course there was a piece of mine and the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group happened to have my oboe quartet in the repertory. The Britain Fantasy Quartet is the great, apart from the Mozart, the great oboe quartet. And ha Benjamin Britten happens to have been Frank Bridges student. So you see these things all click into place. And that's basically how it happened. Did that answer your question? Yes, very okay. much so. I mean, one thing I should point out, though, is that um, he makes it sound like it's an easy task. But um, these are very carefully put together programs, and I, I think everybody on Tuesday appreciated that. And of course, they will tonight too. I think, like I'll venture that out there. Um, yeah. The yeah. final element, which also links today and tomorrow, was, was I was, I wanted to reflect. I mean, I didn't want this all to be about me, 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 which which is boring. But what I wanted was was the uh, to reflect a few uh, 
composers who I have who I have been close to, mm. or friendly with, or have influenced me in the, by either their music or their conversation or what have you. One of them is Peter Lieberson, who was he's, was a, a contemporary and and close friend who died a few years ago. That he's being played tomorrow, a short piece being played tomorrow. At the other end of the spectrum is Elliot Carter. Um, and uh, his very last piece, The Epigrams, was, which he wrote at the age of 103, was given its world premiere last year at the Albra Festival by the Birmingham Contemporary Music Group. So you see that slots into place too. And um, at the, uh, when he was much younger, uh, only 100 years old, <laughs> he wrote a piece for me or at my suggestion, called Windrose. Um, he'd written a little piece for string orchestra called Sound Fields, which was premiered at Tanglewood for his 100th birthday festival. And I happened to be sitting next to him um, during that thing. And the, uh, it, it's a very strange, uh, what's the word? Nothing much happens in the piece. It's just a, a succession of flat planes of sound, but very beautiful. and. Um, I turned around at the end, I said, you really should, it's a piece for string orchestra. And I turned around at the end and I said, you know, you really, it might be interesting if you tried to do that, a piece for winds, like that. Um, two weeks later it was finished, which was rather typical of him in the later years. And unfortunately, apart from the first performance which I gave in London, it's not been played much because, among other things, it involves six flutes, um, I think six clarinets, you have a various uh, family. I mean, it's 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 for I can't remember how many. It's like 24 woodwind instruments or something. So that fitted into the president's own marine band as well. I do feel I know it's difficult to put programs together and all that, but these did feel somehow like they fell into place remarkably. I won't say logically, but in terms of my silly logic, it seemed to work. Well, there is one wild card, and that's the the new commission, because you're not ever sure exactly what you're going to get. Especially <laughs> not from this guy, yes. <laughs> Maybe we could talk about what we got. Uh, what, what are your um, feelings about the piece so far, in terms of uh, having worked on it with, uh, with the group? Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's just that I'm so large that you can't see <laughs> What are my feelings about the piece, now that I've worked with the group? Um, My feelings about the group are that they're wonderful, and they play the piece very well. And my feeling about the piece was that I needed to cut six measures. Which, which I did this morning. Which I right did this morning. Of the um, and I needed to change a couple of markings, which I did. And otherwise, I'm happy more or less with the piece, although it's very strange. And I don't, I guess the only thing I'm not quite sure about is, as it's very strange, I'm not sure if it needs something more, which I go back and forth about thinking it might need something more, and then I think, no, it's, fine in its own strange self. Well, from my vantage point, I had the pleasure of sitting in on some of the rehearsals, and I think it's a very beautiful piece, and I think it's really well played, and it's going to be very enjoyable. Um, one of the things that I, I found interesting about it, and maybe you could speak to this if it uh, resonates with you, um, is that you, your approach to uh, sharing the instrumental colors, uh, it was more like you, you really, uh, often we think about large ensembles, we think about orchestration. But I think that that orchestration component is also very important in these smaller, this is a piano trio, by the way. And you, I really appreciate the way that you handle uh, those instrumentation choices about what's playing in what register and so forth and so on. And well, I've had a lot of experience with two thirds of this. Uh, having played 
virtually every piece in the violin and piano repertoire a hundred times. <laughs> so I'm, I have a great background in understanding the problems of piano and string sound together, which are immense. Uh, and I think the only way to deal with them is a, a combination of separating so that the strings really are playing the way they idiomatically play and the piano is playing its own percussive idiomatic way. Uh, but there's also a way to create a piano sound in which the strings can actually be absorbed. Mm. And so it's a combination of that. But I, I write very idiomatically for strings. Well, it's something you grew up with. I mean, you grew up, practically grew up inside a cello. I grew up as close to inside a cello as you can get. Yeah. Yeah. Both, uh, cellists. both of my parents were cellists. So, in fact, my first pre-nine months were against the back of a cello. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually played... Not when you were in... in <laughs> I couldn't afford the instrument then. <laughs> no, but I played... Well, I'll tell you how small I was. I played a viola with an end pin. So I would have been three or four. So I know, I have a good sense of how you do that scratching. Sure. Well, what about you today? You, I understand that you also had a chance to go take a look at some manuscripts. What was that experience like? Uh, exhausting. It's actually exhausting. And I, I afterwards was thinking, I saw some kind of a crime scene investigation television program a few weeks ago. And the way they caught the guy was because apparently, well, according to television, which is almost science. Well, science fiction anyway. Well, apparently, if you touch something, you can leave DNA on it. And so I started thinking about the Mozart pages I was holding. We'll be I'm checking. Wondering whether there's any Mozart DNA left on them, and yeah, yeah. perhaps I got a bit. Well, you'll soon find out when you sit down to write. If it goes faster, you know you got something. <laughs> <laughs> you start writing a top line and a bass first, and then fill it. You know, there are signs. There's, yeah. There are signs. No, it's, uh, it's actually exhausting to be confronted with paper that he held. And imagine, it's very difficult to absorb that. What piece did you look at? I looked at a violin sonata, which I've played a hundred times and recorded. And I looked at a two viola quintet in C major and it's just astonishing. I mean, they're, they're iconic masterpieces, and this is not printed or a facsimile. It's his paper. That's what I was going to say. Was that the, I've become a, so it's a promiscuous acquirer of facsimiles. Not very expensive ones, but I mean, George Benjamin, the composer, and I exchange facsimiles for Christmas rather often. I mean, we, we both know we're being naughty, so it feels less bad when you're giving it to each other. And the last one I got from him was a facsimile of the Beethoven Opus 111 piano sonata. So when one's looking at the original of Opus 109 and it's sitting in front of you, you think, oh, yeah, I've seen something that looks like this before. And then you realize that, it, that, you, that it, that's the marks on the paper were actually made by Mr. Beethoven. It's very, very odd. It's a very, very odd, odd feeling. Um, I've looked at many things there over, over my several visits. 
every composer, I don't know a composer who would go in there that wouldn't want to look at Wozzeck. That's really just a, 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 an incredible thing to see. And, uh, but I got the biggest thrill the other day, and this will this will blow my credibility as a programmer and everything else. Um, the other day, I I happened to see in the back of a brochure about Mrs. Coolidge that she had been given a gift of a manuscript by a certain composer, and I was able to go the other day and look at the sketches of Respighi's Fountains of Rome, which is a piece that I happen to think is, I mean, I know it's a piece of kitsch and all that, but it's a, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And it is a, a, there's not a bad bar in that piece. There's a bombastic bar in it here and there, mm -hmm. but it's very, very beautiful. And actually to see a piece that you have known since you, uh, since in my case I was, you know, eight years old or something like that, and absolutely adored. When you're a kid, you don't care whether something's kitsch or not. It's just, it's just nice. And to see that actually being, uh, but this was, this was actually, this is just simply he started at the beginning and he started to compose, and you can see he makes some mistakes here and all this sort of thing. Do you see the process of the thing going? Not a, not a, a word hardly, or uh, maybe one one word a page about what the orchestration would be. That obviously was a completely different process for him. But it's that sort of way of feeling close to music that has become a part of you. I mean, that's a, I know that's a, that, I mean, whether it's Wozzeck, Wozzeck is a fair copy. Um, the, the Schoenberg Serenade is more, for example, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a working score. Um, but for me, it's the business of feeling close to the to the process of actually making the thing and where people made mistakes or where things... For example, the other day I, I was looking at a piece... This is going to give me credibility now because this is obscure. I was looking at a piece of, by a composer of whom I'm very fond, which is Busoni. And the manuscript is in over there of a piece of which I'm extremely fond called Rondo alla Chinesco which incidentally was a piece also um, uh, of which Aaron Copeland was very fond of, and he used to conduct. And I saw him conduct that piece. Anyway, there is a little in this, just to give you an example of the kind of thing that's a thrill, there is one particularly gorgeous little transition where a little harmonic slate of hand getting from one type of music to another and from one key to another that is every time I've done this piece, which is a fair amount, I just go, my God, I wish I could do that, you know. It was, it was quite evident from the manuscript that it was a last ditch attempt at saving something because there's a sort of, the page is, is the, the only one of the pages that's sort of too narrow and he's obviously cut a measure out, cut something else out and gone, and, it, and something just happened and it worked. And you do, that, that sort of thing I find very, very thrilling. Well, and I think also um, looking at the Mozart and looking at the Beethoven, it jumps out at you how frenetic and ragged this mm -hmm. Beethoven was, mm -hmm. just from what it looks like on the page compared to the other. It's um, The manuscripts are very revealing said Freud. Whereas, whereas, for example, Brahms, not that I've looked at a great deal of it, I've looked, but I've seen some Brahms manuscripts, and seen one here today, it's, it, it's, it's, um, it's not pretty writing, but it looks like he was writing a letter. It was obviously something completely natural to him to do. And, uh, I mean, this is just, it's, it's an incredible, it's an, I mean, it's not just that it's an incredible collection. It's just an unbelievable learning hole in the ground with many things in that you can learn from, incredible. It is so very distinctive from looking at a published score and I encourage everybody to, to take a look at them when you can. Um, thinking ahead to uh, when you give your collections to the library, <laughs> um, <laughs> how does, uh, when you do the, say you're writing a larger piece, do you produce a short score like the for Schoenberg Serenade, a, a, a Silicept, but you know, what, what sort of a process, it may not be typical, but maybe just an example of that process for you. I'm transitioning. Uh, up until 
quite recently, as some of you know, I've written, made my notes, and then been forced to write a clean score in order to send it to the copyist who takes a lot of my money away in exchange for putting it into a computer. Very recently, due to the number of grandchildren I have promised to put through college, <laughs> and a simple calculation, part of which was, how stupid am I? How come I can't put it in the computer? I've started to do that, and I'm just about two weeks ago have started with my first orchestral score. And what I'm finding, which I, I don't know if this is the way you're supposed to do it. I need to ask more people. Uh, I'm going straight from my notes and sketches onto this printed score, and it works perfectly well. I don't need to make a clean copy for myself to do that from. By notes and sketches, do you mean uh, like a mess. condensed? It's a mess. Oh. It's an utter <coughs> catastrophic mess, which nobody could decipher except me, I believe. Right. So <laughs> the, the real danger is only the last piece. Mm -hmm. You know, if you... Your, if your demise is in the middle of it, it can't be reconstructed. Right. <laughs> what about for you? I'm a, I'm a steam pencil pusher. I mean, I'm a, a Stone Age person. I, because a lot, a part of... Um, I'd say a fairly large part of my compositional process is responding to what I see. I don't mean that what it looks like is more important than what it sounds like or anything like that, but actually the act of taking something that's in your head and putting it down on paper and reacting to how that... You suddenly see something about it that you didn't before and that leads you to go in a certain, certain direction all that. And I mean, I tend to write... I'm quite a chaotic person, but my manuscripts are, are neat. And... Um, I tend to start from a quite neat pencil sketch of some of bits, notes and things, but they're quite legible, very small. I write very small, curiously enough. And then that th th tends to descend into a reworking of that which is illegible, because that's when the, you know one makes lots and lots of decisions. From that, I will tend to make, if it's an orchestral piece, a, a short score um, with everything in. Um, and then uh, I, th I, th I get, I, I mean, I do what many composers do is I, nowadays I get my publisher to, to um, rule the pages out um, if I can predict what, the, what I'm going to need on them. But there is nothing for me like, I don't mean this in any, um, for me there's nothing, I, I, I just for fun last summer um, wrote out a, a copied out a, a piece of music that by a friend, Peter Lieberson, who I, which I had helped to finish. The, he hadn't finished when he died. And I didn't need to write it out by hand from beginning to end, but I, it was a pleasure to do. And when I see it in my writing, I can immediately see when, if something doesn't work, because I'm that used to it. If I see it in cold print, I can sometimes be bamboozled by what it looks like or be so shocked by what it looks like that I lose confidence. Mm -hmm. So I'm somebody who's very uh, tied up with the way something looks on paper. And um, that's a limitation and it makes life, it makes life a little difficult, but um, not least because one has to, you know, one used to travel, I used to travel around, I mean, big sheets of sketch paper in the suitcases and all this sort of nonsense. But I write small, and I, the older I get, the smaller I write. So now I just take around some small paper, and it's just great. Little notebook, that's all I need. But I do think this, for e economically, 
I mean, my publishers would be much happier with me if I did my own computer scores, mm -hmm. but it ain't going to happen. Well, maybe we can come back to uh, tonight's concert, and it, it features uh, a variety of oboe quartets and piano trios. Um, what prompted the ob oboe quartet? I... Mine? Um, I was asked to write one. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I was 23 or 20, 23 years old, and you don't tend to say no at that age. When mm -hmm. Also, it was for a very great oboe player who was a, had been a friend of my father's, who I uh, uh, called Janet Craxton, who unfortunately died um, after only playing it a few times. It was not my fault. <laughs> um, and I struggled like mad with it because, as I said, I, I'm not, I do not have a background in chamber music. I have a background in orchestral music. Um, I do not have a... Um, I'm not used... I'm, I've been to countless, at the time, even then, I've been to countless orchestral rehearsals and I knew how they functioned. But in terms of players getting things together without a conductor, it's a bit like I'm, 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 I'm very unconfident with choral writing because I have no background in that. It's like a, another world. <coughs> but for example, writing for solo voices, I feel I'm completely comfortable. Anyway, so I determined that for once, because any chamber pieces I've written up to that point had always at one wound up having to be conducted because people couldn't hear where the beat was and all that. I was determined that in this particular, uh, uh, in this case, I was going to get it right. And I sort of got it right, but it's very difficult. And the reason that it's, it's uh, the reason that I got it right and the reason that it's difficult is because um, most of, in, through most of the piece, except for one chunk at the climax, the players play independently of each other, but not quite. So if there's a, a solo part, solo line, the chances are the player will, it'll be fully notated, but the player will be free to play it within a certain span of time in the other player's parts who are playing in a different tempo. So it's a lot of what you might call floating sort of rhythm accompaniment thing. And the, what makes it difficult is the points where these things come inside and that they trigger each other off very, um, um, uh, very, very quickly. And um, if it works as the performance that they're giving does, you don't notice that that's what's happening. It just seems to flow and dart about. Um, How did the name come about, Cantata? Because when I'd finished this piece, it was, well, it, I'd originally started, okay, there's going to be a first movement, which is quite wild and oriental, and then a slow movement that does this, and a last movement that does that, and, and I struggled with this thing for so damn long. And when I finally had to salvage something from the wreck before me, um, I found that it actually the piece was there, but I had the parts in the wrong order. And that, in fact, it wasn't discrete movements at all. It was episodes that kind of fed into one another, and then it made, it made sense. And the, the episodes, to me, felt and still feel like recitatives and arias of some kind, or recitatives and, and, and more concerted Choruses, kinds of numbers, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, among the pieces that I liked very much at that time were a new... Um, a new piece of Britain's, one of his last pieces is called Phaedra, which is a dramatic cantata that's modeled in turn on the Handel dramatic cantatas. And I love the Berlioz uh, Cleopatra cantata very much. And um, it felt to me that this was a kind of a, a little dramatic cantata. I have no idea what it's about, but it's about something, and it feels like it's about something. Mark, how did, what about you with your title of, was it a post-composition decision or was it something that guided you at all or? I'm terrible with titles. Um, but 
but I didn't want to settle for piano trio because uh, I had written one piece uh, a few years ago where I had a great title and everybody loved the title. It's called Green Torso, which is a fantastic title. It had absolutely nothing to do with the piece. <laughs> um, but people love the idea. This one, I thought I, I really need a title of some sort. And I had been to Bhutan in December. And there was a fantastic monastery perched up on a hill, uh, a cliff actually, which is called the Tiger's Nest. And I thought, that's a great title for some piece. And since I had some piece, I thought, let's call it that. And then I struggled to find some acceptable connection between the piece and the title. <laughs> and I settled upon a, a kind of feeling that's in the piece which may or may not have anything to do with the tiger's nest. But it's a great title. <laughs> I mean, my feeling about titles in general, <coughs> excuse me, is that um, they're either they either tell you what the thing is as an object, as a formal object or something like that, or what it, or they give you an indication of what tradition it relates to or doesn't relate to because, you, or it simply puts, it should just simply give you a clue as to what m mood you should listen to the thing in, if I can put it like, or which way, what wavelength you should be on. And um, I think his is a very, uh, seems like a rather subjective title, but in fact it isn't at all, I don't think, when you hear the piece. It's, it's, sounds exactly like a tiger's nest. <laughs> um, whereas mine sounds like it's a very, you know, all right, it's a cantata, but in fact it's just a little clue as to, as to how to listen to it. Um, it's funny, it did make me, actually, with listening to Mark's piece, it made me think of um, that final work that Scrabin was working on before he died. The Mysterium. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, as, as something, there's a certain, you know, sort of energy about it that, that struck me in that way. And I don't know if that was influenced by the title or not, but no, the, that's about it. It's not a bad title. It's he called me up. <laughs> Scrabin yeah. was writing this piece. And Mark did. I said, how's it going? And he says, maybe Scrabin. <laughs> so, so it's, you got in the right, you got in the right way there. It's uh, it's. I find it very difficult to write for piano, without some Scriabinesque sound to it. If it sounds good, good. You know, he was uh, very idiomatic for the piano. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of, if you, if you know that music, for me at any rate, if you know that music, and, and, uh, and even if you've have been competently played it on the piano, it's actually sort of inescapable. There's a sort of a, it, do, it doesn't... Well, it's a texture. It's, it's, a texture. it's, it's an texture. incredible texture. I mean, I find, for example, another composer um, who's, if, you, if you've actually physically played it on the piano and... Another composer who is very difficult to um, avoid once you've once you've felt what his piano textures do is Copland. Mm. I find the last page of the Copland piano sonata. I keep. It, I mean, I know my none of my music was keyboards, and nobody would notice that that's where some of it comes from. But I hear it all over the place, mm. and uh, just the way one spaces things. I think it's this. I don't know why I said that, but I f it's probably because Copeland's over there, <laughs> I imagine. Um. Well, I was thinking, um, you're welcome to add a few more things if you'd like, but it might be nice to have a few questions from, from the audience. One, one, one other thing. The Carter Piano Trio, um, which is these, I can't remember how many, it's 11 or 12 or something, 12? 12, 12 little, little tiny epigrammatic movements 
And Carter, somebody asked Carter when he was, you know, getting up there, um, why was he writing faster and faster? And he said, well, I've learned how to doodle, <laughs> which I found very endearing. And these are very, very, well, they're involved doodles. But they are, in a funny sense, doodles. And what, you could, what I find interesting listening to them is that almost all of them are about one or two instruments um, in being in one world and another instrument being in another one. So there's always, there's, a, there's not juxtaposition of actual tempi, but there are juxtaposition of speeds that the notes are going or types of texture, all this sort of thing. His piece is about juxtapositions of different kinds of music very much. And my piece is about juxtapositions of different tempi and all that. And I wonder whether that's a sort of a, a funny, a I did, what? Well, I just, just said, I mean, they're all, they were very, they're very different composers of very different um, ages, as it were. I wonder whether that's something that is just has come about that, that we've been, that, that's rubbed off on us. I'm, I'm talking rubbish now. Well, I, no, I, I think there is certainly something to the texture of different musics at the same time for all of us. The other thing that is interesting is that all of the, and then I think about it, almost all of the pieces in the, this is, uh, in all of the concerts, especially these first two, are music that in which the m making harmonic sense <laughs> of some kind is very important, or is a central concern of the music, which it isn't actually for a lot of a lot of music. There's not a central thing. That may be a particular prejudice of mine, but I love music that has good notes, you know, or as, as George Benjamin and I say to each other, expensive notes. Um, um, and it's, uh, um, I think, I suppose if there's a, there's a particular prejudice in what I do, it is, it's, for, it's for stuff where, where actually the pitches sound very, very well together and make some sort of sense and then going someplace. That's my hope anyway. All right, now I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that definitely comes through in all the pieces tonight, so we, we know that you'll enjoy it. Um, do we have any questions? If you could just wait for the mic, then we'll... Um... I have two unrelated questions. You mentioned the Schumann Symphony Number no. 1, and I wondered if the, part of your interest was the introduction, which supposedly Schumann wrote, um, I guess it would be B-flat, B-flat, uh, G-A, B-flat, but didn't work. <laughs> and uh, Mendelssohn changed the notes so that it was playable. Well, that, that's funny because as far as I remember, in the, in the manuscript which, of which I have a facsimile that, I, that was brought out many years ago, it's not very good, but in the, the manuscript, the, the, to my surprise, it's as we know it. But if you look in the piano sketch, which um, Oxford Press brought out a book about the composition of the Spring Symphony, it is a third lower. And if you listen, <coughs> there are some recordings now of the version that Mahler made of the, um, of the Schumann symphonies. He, he puts it a third lower too. <laughs> but because in the actual manuscript it's it's at the it's at the pitch that we know it and it doesn't appear to be something that's been tacked on, mm. I think it's a it's a kind of um it would be it was kind of controversial just to just to move it back down. It actually sounds better the way it is. Well <laughs> Yeah. Well the theme that comes yeah. in the Allegro is has the pitches yes. lower, yeah. I mean yes. yeah. So my other question is just from the, uh, as a composer, mm -hmm. where the creativity comes from in, in a sort of mystical sense, there are people that talk about, you hear these things in your head or uh, that it's really not an intellectual process or. But that's different for everybody. You go first. I don't know what the question is. Where does it come from? Where does it come from? Is it an intellectual thing, or is it a, or is it something that comes to you? Both. 
Yeah. I mean, simultaneously both. Yeah. Because uh, I would say it's rather difficult to detach your intellect from something that's happening. So, I mean, it, it's kind of both, I, for me anyway. For me, I tend to work very much with very small ideas which n niggle at me, like what they call these days earworms. And I'll tend to design ways of, ways of manipulating these earworms um, or, what things, or, or just observe things that they suggest to me that, happen, that usually happen to fall in to a idea, a bigger idea, for something that's, that's either already there or occurs to me while that's happening. So there's no real, I mean, for example, the last thing I expected to be writing at the moment was a set of pieces um, about the weather. Um, I was writing. I was planning to write some little, a, a, a couple of, a couple of movements for that a friend had asked for for a small string group, and um, I found myself. We had this very turbulent winter over the in, in in England. Not snow, but really a lot of gales and floods and God knows what, all sorts of things. And I found myself thinking about the way various sort of, the, 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 about the behaviour of the movement of notes in certain things and certain textures and that sort of thing. And I suddenly discovered I was writing a set of sort of studies that was, uh, that was about the weather. But I mean, that's not, by the time I'm finished with it, it will have nothing to do with the weather. It'll be a set, it'll be what it started out to be. And one of the funds, what I started out from, one of the great thrills, <coughs> excuse me, certainly for me, of being a composer is when you hear a piece that you've written for the first time. I don't know whether it's a, but when it finally, firstly, when it goes well the first time, and it talks back to you, and you remember what it was that made you want to do it in the first place, but before that moment, you won't necessarily be able to articulate what that was. I hope that makes sense. He's looking at me in a strange way. <laughs> Mr. Nelson, two questions for you. Um, given the program tonight, I wonder if you might say a word to us about your, uh, what led to your, first, to your first encounter with Britain and, oh. and kind of related when the topic of younger and older composers, what was it like working with the student composers this week on Monday and, uh, as part of your residency this week? Okay, let me start from that because that's important and, uh, and uh, it's, it was, it was a, shall we say, it was not a problematical session because the four pieces, um, with possibly one exception, but one slightly slightly different, um, were were very practical. Um, were mostly very well written for the instruments, and one of them was a little a little ambitious for what was going to be a 40-minute reading session. That's why I said what the exception was. But there was nothing actually impractical with it. And, and the composers, I mean, basically, we just played them. That's, in my opinion, what should be done at workshops and reading sessions is as little talk as possible and as much playing as possible. So they get to hear the thing repeatedly and all that. And there's nothing I can stand least. I'm, look, I, I'm losing the capacity for speaking grammatically now. I, there's nothing I hate more <laughs> than going to composers' workshops where the conductor or the director grandstands at the expense of these people. And um, um, so, I mean, basically, there was there, it was for I liked some more than I liked others, but it all went very well. And there was, no, I mean, it's a, it's an important thing to do, and I hope that the um, the young composers were were impressed also by the spectacular sight reading that English players can do, and it's absolutely it's absolutely true what they say. 
There's there's uh, there's no play. I mean, you can you sometimes you you can have different qualities of playing and different. You know, the people, some people like more like less. But one thing that we do that some people say about some English orchestras is that the for the best the best you get from an English orchestra is the sight reading. Because it's spectacular, it's getting them to the next level. This, but it's but it is pretty amazing. Once they got past the accents, then yes, exactly, exactly, absolutely, that's right. <laughs> now, um, you asked about Britain, um, which I'll do. But this, but I, there was a, f I said a fair amount about this in the, um, um, Gu the Guardian newspaper a few months ago because it was the centenary, so I won't take up too much time. But uh, uh, my father was a bass player. He was the principal bass in the London Symphony Orchestra, and he also used to work for the English Chamber Orchestra, or whatever it was, pre the predecessor of the English Chamber Orchestra, who were the house orchestra for Britain's Festival at Aldborough. So uh, when I was a kid, and I mean a kid, uh, so seven or eight, and then later when I was 12 or so like that, I went up with him to Aldborough and sat in um, on Britain's rehearsals and, and met him. And the biggest thrill, one of the two or three biggest thrills of my uh, childhood was sitting through the week of dress rehearsals for the first performance of Curly River, um, which is a piece that had an enormous effect on me. And in fact, what I was talking about with simul the simultaneous tempi and these coming together things are straight out, they're, they're, they're much more out of Britain than they are out of Cal Carter in my case. And. Uh, Britain was uh, a very, if I say approachable, that's slightly, that's slightly uh, 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 making a little more raise. He was quite, he was quite formal. He was sort of relaxed. He was like a, like they say, he was like a, um, like a very nice school teacher, um, but of of that generation. But he had a capacity which um, I've only met, come across in a very few other people, one of them being Leonard Bernstein, who couldn't have been diff more different personally than Britain, that who, no matter who you are, when they're talking to you, they make you feel like you're the only person on the planet and that, that, that your concerns are their concerns. And I think it was uh, sitting with Britain in his house with my father there, and being talked to in such a way as, um, oh, do you have trouble uh, planning your pieces out? Because I sometimes do. Or, or, or well, I said, well, no, I don't have trouble doing that because I don't plan my pieces out. Said, oh, you really should try it sometime. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, he says, then, don't you find, uh, do you find doing harmony? How do you find doing harmony? Well, I said, I, 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 uh, I, I do do harmony, I don't find it difficult, easy. And he said, well, do you do counterpoint? And I said, no, my teacher doesn't. You, you bully that teacher until he teaches you counterpoint. And it was very, um, he, he put his finger on a couple of very basic things for a kid. And, and, ba and that, those things stick with you. Um, he was a very uh, charismatic, nicely, uh, a very charismatic man, a very, very, I mean, I remember going to rehearsal once. Um, you know, I was around uh, 12 or 13 years old, and it was in a room not unlike this, but it was somebody's big drawing room, and uh, there were no chairs, and the ensemble was there, and Britain was conducting. He was actually get, doing an instrumental rehearsal of a revival of Cody River, and I was curled up on the floor in the corner. And he was sort of, and he looked over at some point, and didn't, I, 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 just, you know, I wasn't sort of making, drawing attention to myself. Suddenly came over with a huge sheaf of sheets of paper and sort of threw them at me. You know, so he says, "You might find these interesting," <laughs> and they and they were actually the proofs, so I could follow the score all the way through. It was, it was very, yeah. So I have very very good memories of of, of him. I think we have time for just one more brief question. I would love to hear Mr. Newsom talk more, but in fairness to Mr. Nykrug, could you? No, I, I, 
could you talk just a little bit um, quickly? Did you know Dina Costin? And could you talk about yourself as a dramatic composer as well as an instrumental composer? Because I first heard your Through Roses piece, and then I had a deja vu on Tuesday when I read about your Alamo opera, which was the first American opera ever commissioned by the Berlin State uh, Opera. And do you, do you feel, do you have a sense that the Metropolitan will, will do this? Or do you, are you con continuing dramatic? Do you, anything you want to say, thanks. <laughs> yes. Uh, n I have no sense whatsoever that the Metropolitan Opera will do this. <laughs> no, I don't. They did another one. I know they did. Yeah. Uh, different stars. S let's hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm quite fascinated with uh, theater simultaneously with music. So uh, through Roses was really about trying to write drama in real time as opposed to opera time. And I always wanted to write something after that and I never had a very good idea until rather recently, a couple of years ago, maybe two, and I came up with a new theater piece which happens to have a great title. Uh, it's called Death Row Memoirs of an Extraterrestrial. <laughs> and it's about a half an hour long, and it's about a man who either is a paranoid schizophrenic or is inhabited by an alien. Uh, both of which can be quite similar. And it's, it's a bit like Through Roses in that sense. It's one actor, piano, violin, and clarinet. And I would love to do more of those without singing. But with spoken, well, acted. Not spoken, not a speaker, but an actor. And the... The real reason for that was that when we learn how to write for voice, one of the first things that, that we're told is to calculate more or less three times as long for anything that's sung as opposed to speaking the same words. And that always made me feel that the dramatic flow has a kind of time distortion. And I love the idea of real time acting and speaking, but without losing the power of the music. The end. Well, thank you guys both so much for, uh, for being here and also for being part of this residency. Uh, thank also to our, uh, the BC Birmingham Contemporary Music Group for performing tonight and on Tuesday. And then tomorrow we have the uh, President's Own Marine Band uh, finishing up the week. Uh, so please join me in uh, thanking uh, Oliver Nelson and Mark Nykrupp. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.